thanks for uh, joining us tonight for this uh, edition of the Marxist Classes, where we'll be looking at uh, Karl Marx's The Class Struggles in France, 1848 to 1850, which is a collection of four uh, essays published kind of as uh, revolutionary events were unfolding in France. Uh, the Education Collective originally approached me about um, facilitating a discussion of one of Marx's works on France, uh, I think over a year ago, and uh, my first thought was, okay, you know, this will be relatively straightforward. I've, I've studied French history. I know some of the, the context of it. And it ended up uh, being much more challenging than I thought. Uh, the more I looked at this text, the more it started raising questions for me, um, the less I was sure that I understood what Marx was saying. And even when I thought I did understand, I wasn't exactly sure how to you know, use that to think through our, our current moment. So I'm hoping that um, there's some time for discussion tonight and that we can kind of uh, approach some of those questions that I've been uh, trying to work through. Um, this, uh, as I said, the class struggles in France is the first of uh, three works that, that Marx uh, wrote on France. Uh, the second is the uh, 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, uh, which describes the coup d'etat of 1851 uh, and the establishment of the Second Empire. The third is the Civil War in France, which deals with the end of the Second Empire, the Paris Commune, and the really bloody repression of the Paris Commune. That's 1871. Um, so France was in uh, Marx's uh, sites for a long time. He lived in Paris for a while. Um, he was very uh, conversant with, with socialist circles there. And this really did come out of so his attempt to think through revolutionary events as they were uh, unfolding. Um, as I said, I think we're going to try to leave a bunch of time for discussion, uh, which I think I forgot to ask um, D how the discussion is going to uh, is going to work. Um, it's up to you. Um, so we could do either uh, written comments through the chat or a combination of written comments through the chat and uh, raising your hand through the, is there a, so can, the you, can, you, can you see the question box? Uh, yes, when I, yes, so I see the, the chat type message here. Uh, not, we usually don't use chat, it's the okay. question box. You see the uh, line under polls that says questions? Uh, no. Then maybe we should just have everyone um, everyone use the raised hand icon if they want to ask a question or make a comment. Okay. And uh, how do I find who is? I see. I'm looking under attendees. Uh, I'll do that. I'll do okay, that. Part. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Without further ado, then I think. Uh, We've got a lot to talk about, so I, I might just uh, launch into the uh, the discussion here. Um, so, uh, where in Marx's work are we with uh, class struggles in France? Um, so it dates from about the same, or the first essay in the collection dates from about the same time as the Communist Manifesto. Communist Manifesto was February twenty first, eighteen forty eight. Um, the February Revolution in France, 1848, is February 25th, I believe, or that's the culmination of it. Um, this work kind of is part of a turning point for Marx. Uh, before this, he's mostly, he's an argumentative guy, uh, as people who've read him probably have noticed. Um, before this, he's really arguing a lot with philosophers. After this, he starts arguing with economists and taking on uh, bourgeois political economy. And his vocabulary is sort of changing. His way of analysis is changing. Um, class struggle and revolution, revolutionary tactics, are starting to occupy a much bigger 
part of his thought. Um, and he's become a member of uh, a group called uh, the League of the Just, which was a sort of uh, utopian socialist group that eventually um, became the Communist League. Uh, and we've already talked about the three uh, works on France. Where in French history are we? So since the revolution of 1789, France has been kind of in political turmoil. Um, so 1789 begins the process of getting rid of the old regime and the monarchy. Uh, they go through a few governments. 1804, they come back to an empire with Napoleon I getting crowned by the Pope. In 1814, Napoleon's defeated at Waterloo and the dynasty of the old kings, the Bourbons, comes back. Um, it becomes, it's originally a constitutional monarchy, but it becomes increasingly repressive. There's a revolution in 1830 to sweep aside the Bourbons and put another royal house, the House of Orléans, on the throne. Um, that ushers in the period known as the bourgeois monarchy. There are some limited democratic reforms, but it's mostly a transfer of power from the old aristocrats to bankers. Um, and uh, France is kind of in, just in ferment. So I mean, my, my mother is currently 61 years old. She was born in 1955, and her entire life she's known the same form of government, regular elections, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody who was 61 years old in 1848 would have seen a coup or revolution roughly every 10 to 15 years in France. Um, so it was a, a time of, uh, uh, like I said, of turmoil. It's also uh, tough economically. There have been a few years of bad harvests uh, that, drove, that drive farmers to the city, and uh, businesses are, are failing as well. There's an economic crisis. So that's kind of what's going on in the background here. And there are two events in 1848. You could think of them as two revolutions or two phases of one revolution or a successful revolution and a failed revolution. In any case, in February, there's this mass uprising against the bourgeois monarchy, against Louis Philippe, against the bankers, uh, the whole lot of them. And it's a it's from all sectors of French society. It's, it's workers that, who want jobs, it's small business people, and we'll come back to the term petty bourgeoisie, small business people demanding democracy, the industrial bourgeoisie, the factory owners against the bankers. Um, it's really a, a mass, mass uprising. And it results in the formation of a second republic. The first one was after the first French Revolution. Um, and the big step forward is universal male suffrage, so the ending of property qualifications for voting, which is a, a huge deal. Uh, the major demand of the working class in this is jobs, um, that the, the government create jobs for people, um, and the, the Second Republic does not deliver on that. Um, so in June of 1848, the government of the Second Republic, this new revolutionary republic from February 1848, has taken a conservative turn. Uh, workers have found that, you know, they did a lot of work, but it hasn't gotten them a seat at the table. They arm themselves and build barricades to take over Paris, which in France in the 19th century is synonymous with taking power over the entire country. Uh, when this happens, the middle class, the petty bourgeoisie, the small business owners, uh, abandon the working class and they join with the big bourgeoisie um, in defense of property. Right? Uh, we've got to save property. And the working class is slaughtered in the streets. And this is the moment when the Second Republic is no longer this coalition, this uh, grappling of different parties, different class and social forces. It's the big bourgeoisie establishing definitive control over state power. Um, so the, the defeat of the workers in 1848 is really a key moment. Um, on this, this process and on its, its consequences, 1848 to 1850, I think there are three lenses that we can use to look at Marx's essays. Um, one is the idea of the clarification of class relations. So how does this revolution change 
the relations between different classes. Uh, second is the role of the middle class or small business people. And third is the role of the constitution and the institutions of bourgeois or capitalist democracy. Um, these aren't the only lenses by any means, but I'm going to sort of single these out as sort of relevant for our moment. So political life under the bourgeois monarchy, as Marx described it, I basically already summed it up. Um, it's ruled by bankers, as Marx says, bankers, stock exchange kings, railway kings, owners of iron mines and forests, and landowners associated with them. So this is the finance aristocracy um, that, uh, that accumulates wealth by lending money to the state and then uh, taking interest. The industrial bourgeoisie, so the factory owners, as distinct from the bankers, was part of the official opposition. Its interests were opposed to those of the bankers. So it found itself siding with workers and small business people against this bourgeois monarchy. Um, and because of property restrictions, as I said before, only a tiny minority of French citizens could vote. Uh, so when we talk about mass political acti activity, we're not talking about get out the vote, door knocking, canvassing. Uh, it's journalism, demonstrations, barricades, occupations, and eventually street fighting. Because again, um, most, of, most citizens were locked out of uh, the democratic process. Um, so 1848, we've said before, this revolution happens and we set up a second republic, a, a democratic, bourgeois democratic republic. Um, and the workers, as Marx points out, are the ones who really are responsible for, for winning this. So I'm not going to read this, this whole thing out loud. Most of the text passages I put on here are just sort of for the benefit of, of people who receive the PowerPoint so, you know, they can see what passages I'm referring to. Um, basically, February 25th, uh, Louis Philippe, the king, is toppled. But the provisional government is formed with representatives of, the, of, of these different classes. But there's no word yet on what the new government is going to be. And uh, this um, insurrectionist communist Raspail uh, went to the place where the provisional government was sitting. And he said, in the name of the workers, I'm commanding you to proclaim a republic. That is a, a representative democracy with elections and a constitution and the whole deal. And if you don't do that, within two hours, I'm going to come back with 200,000 people. And he means armed people. Um, and all of a sudden, the provisional government says, yes, republic. Let's have one. Democracy, liberty, equality, fraternity. Right? So... The, the threat of armed insurrection by the working class was what pushed this revolution in the direction of, uh, of, of a republic, so of elections, some democracy, constitution, all of that. What did this signify for the working class? Um, and Marx has a few ways of talking about this. Um, he, he says, again, I'm not going to read these out loud, uh, but he makes several claims, and this is mostly in the first essay, the opening pages of the first essay. First of all, this revolution in 1848 sets the stage for a kind of final conflict between the working class and the capitalist class, that we're clearing the stage. Um, and from, from here on out, the major actors in society will be workers and capitalists. Um, that the bourgeois uprising against the monarchy, so the capitalist class getting rid of the monarchy, shows that class power or state power belongs to the capitalist class, to the bourgeoisie. And he says... The working class cannot win its own emancipation in the struggle for a bourgeois republic, but it can't 
win its emancipation without a bourgeois republic. And this is the second quoted passage on this slide. Uh, Marx writes, the proletariat stepped into the foreground forthwith as an independent party, but at the same time challenged the whole of bourgeois France to enter the lists against it. What it won was the terrain for the fight for its revolutionary emancipation, but by no means this emancipation itself. Um, so it won the space to fight for socialism, basically. Uh, finally, um, the claim he's making is that before uh, socialism can, before socialist revolution can occur, the antagonism between the working class and the capitalist class has to mature, has to develop, has to come to the forefront in society. And that can't happen as long as the power of the capitalist class is hiding behind this kind of leftover feudalism, right? He says that um, the it, it, the February Revolution struck off the crown behind which capital kept itself concealed. So Marx is saying that the this new democratic republic, this bourgeois republic rather, is what sets the stage for class struggle under capitalism. And this is really reminiscent of the Communist Manifesto. In in the first chapter, communist or um, bourgeois and proletarians where he basically says what makes capitalism different from every preceding social organization is that now we have two classes. And so a revolution that abolishes the capitalist class will abolish the class, the class society and class conflict altogether. And he's, he's thinking in a similar vein here. Um, and this is kind of the first set of questions that that I come to about it. And they're, they're interlocking questions and I wanna take some time to, to kind of talk about them. So what did Marx mean when he said that the February Revolution won the working class the terrain to fight for rev revolutionary emancipation? Second, Marx seems to be proposing a kind of two-stage struggle. First, you get a bourgeois republic. And by bourgeois republic, again, I mean a, a capitalist democracy like, um, you know, we have today in the United States, in France, in um, Italy, and in a lot of other countries. First you get a bourgeois republic, then you fight for socialism. Is that what he's saying? And if so, why has the fight for socialism been so long in taking shape in developed capitalist democracies? And how might we think of the fight against fascism within the framework that Marx provides here of you know, democratic and socialist struggle. Um, so thoughts, questions, uh, different readings. Uh. Okay, we have um, Alex, your mic is open. Alex, your mic is open. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Scott, for putting this presentation together and going over the class struggle um, in France. Um, this is important work. And also, I want to applaud you for your great work, um, your great article about uh, does the fight against, does getting rid of Trump matter? I thought that was a great article. I shared that on Facebook, and you oh, made a really good argument. You. Yeah, thanks. no problem. But getting back to the point and these questions, um, I um, yeah I'm not I'm not so sure about um, this question of is the bourgeois republic necessary first to fight for socialism I'm kind of I I'm not really sure about that but the second question about the fight against fascism um, you know maybe I'm stating the obvious here but like I think um, in order for in order for the working class to have the terrain to fight for revolutionary emancipation i think um the far right um fascist extreme nationalist forces have to be really uh decisively defeated and um really need to be rejected by the overwhelming majority of the society so so in today i think um, applying this to today, I would think that we really have to 
um, defeat the emerging far right um, decisively before we can begin to uh, try to uh, try to begin to strengthen the fight for uh, re social progressive socialist revolution. Um, so that's that's uh, what I think, and uh, thanks for your consideration. Thanks, Alex. Other uh, uh, questions, thoughts, responses? If you'd like to uh, speak, please use your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. Just click your your click the image of a hand with the, your cursor, and I will see be able to open your mic. Okay, it looks like okay. Here we go. Corey, your your mic is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I just had a comment. Um, I don't know who said kind of a question too. Who was it that said uh, the reason why socialism never took root in America is because Americans see themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires? Uh, that's Steinbeck, right? John I, Steinbeck. I, I think, think so. Um, but thanks for doing this. I, w I was trying to read um, some of the articles that you were um, you've been talking about. Um, I managed to find a uh, package of different Marx books. So I've been trying to keep up, trying to read. Um, it's kind of it's kind of surprising to me, kind of a little bit scary, weird. Um, I hear all the time from my conservative religious friends that, you know, like the Book of Revelation reads like the newspaper today. <laughs> well, I'm kind of thinking the same thing here with with uh, you know like with the Communist Manifesto and then I, this first article. It's like oh my god, this is what's going on right now. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. I, I, and I couldn't remember who, who said that quote, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Um, I think I, I might take the chance to respond to, uh, to those two, and then, you know, if we have other, other questions, maybe take more. Um, so, uh, the the connection to the sort of book of revelation and and kind of the apocalypse is a an interesting one because one of the you know one of the ways and one of the things that makes this work difficult is that marx was thinking this was written in a time when revolutions were were happening all over europe in germany and italy um, uh, and in in other parts of the world as well i think in uh, in Mexico, I believe there was some there was a revolutionary ferment, um, and so Marx really thought, I think, that he thought that um, the kind of decisive conflict of the proletariat and capital was was maybe much closer than than historically it, it has turned out to be. Uh, in the same way, maybe that early Christians, um, you know, they really thought that. The, the, the return of Christ and the judgment and the end times were, were sort of imminent. Uh, so obviously we, you know, neither of those things have happened as far as I can can see. Um, on the the idea of the, the, the decisive, the two stages and the decisive defeat of the right, what this, the, the, the direction I found my thought going in was to say that maybe what Marx was talking about is not simply one stage followed by another stage, not bourgeois republic and then you know you get that and all of a sudden the fight for socialism is is the the major thing. At least from a historical perspective, what it looks like is that the the bourgeois republic is the context for the fight for socialism. So it's not like, you know, the question of bourgeois democracy is, is over and done with as soon as we get a constitution and, and the right to vote. Um, it's, it's an evolving thing within which we have to be uh, fighting for, for socialism. The other thing to take into account is, you know, when Marx talks about the bourgeois republic, it is still a really limited, limited thing. 
Um, the Second Republic in France does finally uh, eliminate the, uh, um, outlaw the slave trade, um, which had been going off and on in legally in France uh, for a long time, or in, in French colonies. Um, uh, it, the right to vote was not extended to women until the 1950s in France. Um, so there, there are still a lot of people who are excluded from this bourgeois republic. So one of the reasons that the, the question of this decisive conflict of the working class and capital can't come to the fore is because it's shot through with, obscured by um, all of these other democratic questions um, that have to be uh, addressed as matters of class unity. You can't have, you know, a united working class confronting capital when you know, part of that working class is enslaved, uh, as Marx will write somewhere else. So that's kind of where, where my thinking is going, right? that, that the, it's not bourgeois republic, then fight for socialism, it's within the bourgeois republic we have the context to uh, develop the struggle uh, for socialism. Um, and that's how it links to the, the fight against fascism as well, right? Where we can't fight for socialism as long as um, the uh, even the tenets of, of, of the bourgeois republic, even the limited democracy of, of, of capitalism is, is under attack. Um, so uh, any other questions on this section? Okay, if you'd like to speak, use your raised hand icon. Just click it. I see someone has written something. Let me see if I can open my... Um, someone wrote, uh, how do we decisively defeat the right without revolution? Ooh, <laughs> um, I guess I'm gonna maybe take that question and and adapt it a little bit if I can and ask what what would it look like to decisively defeat the far right? Because we talk about the decisive defeat of the far right. What does that really mean? And, and one of the ways I think about it is in terms of what's on the table and what's off the table. So for me, a decisive defeat of the far right means that, you know, um, restrictions on uh, reproductive choice are simply not a question anymore. Um, they're just off the table. Um, the question of uh, whether police can slaughter people of color or and 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 white people as well with impunity is simply off the table. Uh, the question of rampant and, and careless use of natural resources, um, ever increasing fossil fuel consumption is off the table. So I, that's how I think of a decisive defeat of the far right. A lot of those things can be won, I think, under, under capitalism. Um, though, one of the essays I like to think of is Lenin's or his pieces, uh, Lenin's speech on the fourth anniversary of the October Revolution, where he says, you know, we uh, fulfilled a lot of the promises of bourgeois democracy, equality, freedom of religion, all of those things, but we didn't do it because we aimed at bourgeois democracy. We did it as a byproduct of our fight for socialism. Um, so maybe that's that's a way of thinking about that question. We can win. We can't get to revolution without defeating the far right, but we can defeat the far right in the context of, of fighting for socialism. Uh, I think at that we should probably uh, move on. Um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for more 
uh, questions and discussion. Um, so this is a short section, the middle class. Um, I've been using the word petty bourgeoisie. That's the term Marx uses. I also use middle class or small business people. Um, this is a term that's hard to get a handle on, right? Uh, because we tend to say middle class to refer to just about anybody. I saw one article, in fact, that was talking about the global middle class. And the guidelines for middle class was on one end having indoor plumbing to on the other end making about $250,000 a year, which is, you know, a pretty big range. Um, so middle class has really been used to obscure a lot of things. What Marx means by petty bourgeoisie, or middle class, are people that control enough of the means of production to make a profit from their own labor. So shopkeepers, restaurant owners, um, artisan, artisans who own their own tools. Today we might think of independent like contractors who own their equipment, things like that. So uh, June 1848, so February, big mass uprising, many different class and social forces together um, to establish a bourgeois, bourgeois republic. In June, the workers rise up to demand jobs, the right to a job, the right to an income, and uh, the big capitalists, the big bourgeoisie, and the middle class go out into the streets and put down this uh, insurrection, this uprising of the workers. And I want to, I love this passage, so I think I'm going to read it out loud. Um, no one had fought more fanatically in the June days for the salvation of property and the restoration of credit than the Parisian petty bourgeois. Keepers of cafes and restaurants, wine merchants, small traders, shopkeepers, handy craftsmen, etc. The shopkeeper had pulled himself together and marched against the barricades in order to restore the traffic which leads from the streets into the shop. But behind the barricades stood the, cu the customers and the debtors, before it the creditors of the shop. And when the barricades were thrown down and the workers were crushed and the shopkeepers, drunk with victory, rushed back to their shops, they found the entrance barred by a savior of property, an official agent of credit who presented them with threatening notices, overdue promissory note, overdue house rent, overdue bond, doomed shop, doomed shopkeeper. It was precisely from them that this property had to be saved for the house owner who left the house, for the banker who discounted the promissory note, for the capitalist who made the advances in cash. Um, so Marx isn't exaggerating here. Uh, over the course of, um, I think, I don't know, 1846 to, through 1848, about half of the businesses in Paris disappeared, collapsed, closed, moved elsewhere. Um, they were wiped out. Um, and later on, we're going to come back to this question of the middle class and its divided loyalties uh, in a little bit. Um, so what Marx is saying here is that the class interests of the small business owners, this middle class, really place them with the workers because they're both being victimized by capital. But they're, they perceive their allegiance as being to property and thus um, stand on the side of the, the capitalist class. And this gets back to um, what uh, I believe it was Corey was saying about uh, temporarily embarrassed millionaires, right? Uh, every small business person thought they were you know, they have more in common with, uh, with a billionaire than with a worker. So my question on this is a, a pretty straightforward one. Does the middle class, in this technical sense, uh, petty bourgeoisie, still play the role that Marx describes? Is it still this class that, that has class interests on the side of the workers, but ideological loyalties on the side of capital? What do people think? There were a few hands left from the last. Uh... Okay, we can take a few. Okay, Carol, your your mic is open. Carol. Yeah, I just going back. I I just think it's a problem to to say that there's two stages, and then you can you can. I understand the part about the terrain. You know, you have the context then for the fight, you know, for emancipation. But I think that when you talk about the, the two stages, that you have a bourgeois democracy and then you can fight for socialism, uh, there is no way that Marx 
could have seen the incredible developments, industrial, technological, but more than that, the the um, the uh, lack of consciousness. And you know, we ask the question, why does it take so long? You know, for, to have socialism. Uh, well, they do a they do a job. You, you know, uh, that part of everything they do is to keep the working class from seeing itself, you know, as a class unto itself. And so, class consciousness grows very, very slow, very slowly. It, you know, in some areas, in the industrial, in the unions, it can grow much faster. But I think that it, it's a very, very important point, and especially in terms of racism um, in our country, it's a huge question uh, um, in order to unite, you know, the, the uh, working class. So I think that there are so many questions in relation to class consciousness that is not, you know, talked about in this two-stage solution, it just seems like, hmm, very easy. You just, you go from one stage to the other. It's a big fight, but you can do it. But in, I think in our, today, it's not possible to talk about, you know, two stages. We don't even know how many stages uh, <laughs> there will be, you know, in this country. We can see developments, we can see advances, we can see all kinds of things happening. And then we can get pushed back, just like a lot of the, you know, many of workers got stuck on Trump. You know, how is that possible? Coal miners, steel workers, you know, well, it's very possible because the media, the TV, the uh, politicians, the you name it, we, we, know, we know all that, um, do a job, you know, on, you know, on the working class. And I think it's a huge question, um, especially in terms of um, class unity, class unity, you know, and the fight against racism and look what's happening how backwards, how backwards you know, we're going in terms of, of uh, racism. Anyway, that's I, what I what mean to say is that there are huge, huge, huge questions, especially on that one basic question of class consciousness and working class unity that I that probably takes a whole session to talk about. But so I don't so so I, I have a problem with this two stages. You know, you can have this bourgeois democracy and then you can fight for socialism. Well. I think there's just a, a lot left out, out of there, and there's no way that Marx could have, you know, could have seen that, although he saw amazing. Anyway, I, I just wanted to raise that as something we need to get into. Thank I, you. I, it's excellent. It's very good. Thank you. Uh, other? Yeah. Um, okay. Caroline? You need to unmute your mic. All right, Caroline, your mic should be open. Caroline, you should be able to speak. Okay. Just a second. Emil, your mic is open. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Scott. This is really a tremendous presentation. I hope we have many more and that you continue to enlighten us on these important his historical and theoretical terms. Uh, on the issue of the transition from the fight to the for a bourgeois republic to the fight for socialism, I think that one thing that was characteristic of much of the thinking in Marx's time, not only Marx and Engels and others, was this linear idea that things could never go in the other direction. Uh, I think that's a flaw in Marx. I really don't know if he corrected it afterwards. But we saw with what happened in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union that uh, the ruling class interests remained clean through uh, or, or people who were ideologically committed to the ruling class positions remained clean through the socialist period 
in those countries and that they played a major role in the restoration of capitalism. And not only did you have bourgeois elements and petty bourgeois elements who uh, thought of themselves as temporarily embarrassed Hungarian <laughs> and, and Polish and, and uh, Czech uh, millionaires, you had even the old aristocracy, you know, the big famous names of the, the former landowning aristocracy trooping back, for instance, into the Czech Republic and demanding that their estates and palaces be restored to them, which in many cases they were. So I think it's a, it's a two-directional thing. And Marxist theory, I, I, I wouldn't say that Marxist theory isn't absorbing that lesson. But I think we have to talk about it more. Secondly, I would like to very much endorse the previous speakers, previous commentators' idea of doing more, uh, doing one of these sessions on ideological formation and uh, getting into territory of Gramsci and some others who've worked on that. And uh, again, I thank you, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Emil. Um, do we have a uh... A couple, do you have any other comments? Yes. Or questions? Or, okay. Vaughn, your, your mic should be unmuted now, and y you need to unmute yourself on your end. Just click your mic, and it should unmute Vaughn. Vaughn, you should be able to click your mic. There you are. There you are. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for this presentation. You obviously are very well uh, prepared on the subject. And I would like to uh, also endorse the speaker before the last uh, gentleman who referred to the issue of uh, class consciousness and the fact that working people are deluded into identifying with a character like Trump voting against their their own economic and class interest. And I believe the question, the issue that you posed was, is currently, is there currently a problem with middle class or the petty bourgeoisie identifying with the the rich, the super rich, uh, as their interest when in fact their true interest is closer to that of the working people, of the proletariat. I would say that the problem is not only that, but that the working class in this country itself identifies with the property classes. They believe that if they just work hard enough under this notion of rugged individualism, which is so ingrained in the society, that they too can become millionaires. Therefore, they don't identify with a class. It's the individual pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. This is the, the virus, the disease, which separates him from his class, prevents him from joining forces, from identifying collectively with those with whom he must struggle against the property classes. Now, how do we remove that? How do we re take the individual, educate him as to his true economic interest, and motivate him to work together rather than apart and join in the class struggle? That's the real problem. And the other one is that there are so many writers right now that are stating, I think correctly, that capitalism is on its last leg. It's not only an antiquated system, but it will collapse. And I'm talking about global capitalism, uh, uh, neoliberalism that promotes this house of cards on which global capitalism is built. If it collapses, according to a very well-known economist and sociologist in Germany, Wolfgang Streck, uh, what will replace it is virtually nothing for the foreseeable future. Capitalism will collapse and there'll be a period of uncertainty, a period of economic, um, I would say, dark ages. 
for lack of a better term. Uh, if that happens, that'll be an indication that we were not ready for what what will happen next. If the collapse of capitalism, we'll have nothing to replace it. Therefore, we need to work, I think, directly with the working class. And of course, Lenin's uh, direction for a united front is worthwhile. But as far as this idea that you can reform a capitalist party like the Democratic Party and turn a lion into a lamb, I don't think it's going to happen. We need to go directly to the workers. Certainly, we need to have United Front with all kinds of organizations, whether they're, they're environmental, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, women's groups, uh, uh, all of these groups that are, in fact, protesting against the Trump administration and his policies. That's fine, but we have to separate ourselves from the Democratic Party and not believe that we can change a capitalist party into a socialist party. Again, thank you for this presentation. Thank you, Vaughn. Uh, I think I'm going to try to respond very, very quickly to uh, some of the points that were raised and then move on to the uh, the next uh, sec, the final section. Um, so, uh, Carol, um, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think I do. Uh, but the, the two-stage schema that Marx seems to be proposing is, is reductive. Um, I'm, like I said, I'd add, I'm not certain that he's, is he proposing that as kind of a, a general schema or as a specific historical thing? I'm not sure, but we certainly have to. That's not the end of, of um, that's not the definitive word on the, on the subject, absolutely. And, and um, as everyone has said, uh, you know, we have to think in our strategic and our tactical work about you know, how do we build class consciousness, how do we engage in ideological work, and how do we um, specifically, uh, you know, take to people this, this link between um, racism and capitalism and anti-racism and, and working class solidarity, and not just uh, racism, but, but all of the, the ideologies that, that divide uh, the working class and, and um, you know, facilitate capitalism's continued uh, existence. Um, uh, as far as the Democratic Party goes, um, you know, in a certain sense, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by reading this, this, the class struggles in France, because the February Revolution, it really was everybody from, from the old aristocracy all the way to, um, you know, to the, the revolutionary sort of armed insurrectionists of the, uh, the various communist organizations. And I, I guess what I would say is that, again, we, we fight for socialism um, insofar as that fight uh, includes things that other groups are fighting for, then there's, uh, you know, we, we, it, it may make sense to just work uh, alongside them. We, of course, don't trust them. We don't consider them you know, our, our friends, uh, we don't consider them reliable long-term allies, obviously, but um, right now there are certain democratic questions that um, forces in the Democratic Party uh, can can help us advance. Um, and I know that that doesn't end the question and that discussion will be ongoing, but I wanted to respond quickly. Um, so final big question. Um, in this the, the last couple essays here, dealing with 1849 and 1850, Marx is going to be talking about the different parties and class forces in the, the bourgeois republic. Um, and his, his real argument is against what we might consider an idealist understanding of the state and the constitution. So out of the European Enlightenment came this idea of you know, to, make a, to set up a government, to set up a state, you get the best and the brightest together and you have them dream up this ideal form, and then you write it down in a constitution, and that becomes the form of the state. And Marx says, no, 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 no. A constitution is actually a product of a certain set of class relations, right? It, it comes from material conditions. Um, and he's going to, he doesn't really come out and say that directly, but he's gonna get to that point in a number of different ways uh, as we go through this last section. So when the constitution of the Second Republic was being 
uh, drafted, um, the constituent assembly, the group that was drafting it, declared a state of siege in Paris. Um, and they basically, Paris was under martial law while this supposedly democratic constitution was being drafted. And not long after it was drafted, it, uh, and it, it faced its first crisis. So there were these organizations called clubs. They were political discussion groups, um, often revolutionary political discussion groups. And the ruling class, the bourgeois forces in the National Assembly decided that they were dangerous um, and they should be suppressed. Of course, the Constitution, as ours does, protected the right to free association. Um, so we're faced with this contradiction between what the Constitution says and what the class forces who uh, drafted the Constitution uh, actually want. Um, and Marx says, what the Constitution was to constitute above all else was the rule of the bourgeoisie. By the right of association, the Constitution could mean only associations that harmonized with the rule of the bourgeoisie. So he's saying the Constitution is a tool of class power. It's not an ideal form that exists above the state to regulate everything. Um, it's not binding upon the ruling class. It's an instrument of the ruling class. So points of comparison with our situation. Um, our Constitution guarantees the right to bear arms. But does that include uh, non-white citizens? Um, if people in Black Lives Matter decided to arm themselves, would uh, uh, would conservative Republicans be, you know, waving their flags and talking about the Second Amendment? The right to free speech, which has become a tool to attack labor unions and protect uh, the rights of corporate money. The right to association, except when people get together to block uh, fossil fuel exploitation like at Standing Rock, right? So these are instances where the Constitution is clearly, you know, used by the ruling class to advance its own interests. On the other end, the 14th Amendment, one of the great products of Reconstruction, um, uh, had a, a key role in the civil rights struggle, the struggle for marriage equality, the defense of public education, Right? So it'd be too simplistic to say, you know, the Constitution, throw it away. It's just a tool of class power. I think what Marx is, if, if we look at what Marx is saying, think about it through our historical experience and our struggle for democracy and socialism, what he's saying is that the interpretation of the Constitution is a terrain of class struggle. Right? Um, what the Constitution means, what is constitutional, what is unconstitutional, um, is decided by class struggle and is not built into uh, the Constitution. Um, sorry, I'm going somewhat quickly here. Um, uh, the second crisis had to do with the, the Roman Republic. Uh, basically, 1849, um, a republic was declared in Rome, which up until then was under the control of the Pope. The Pope had fled. Um, he appealed to these reactionary ruling class forces in France who sent troops to Rome to uh, restore him to power, Pope Pius IX. Now, the new constitution of the Second Republic forbid the use of military force to interfere with the liberty of another people. It was pretty clear. And the leader of this democratic middle class party called the Mountain says, the president, Louis Bonaparte, has violated the Constitution. He and his ministers must be impeached. We must defend the Constitution even by force of arms. That motion is defeated in the Parliament and the Mountain, this party, withdraws. But instead of pursuing their defense of the Constitution, they issue this sort of tepid article, you know, this vague call to arise with the slogan, long live the Constitution. Um, Marx has this kind of sly, witty way of talking about it, saying, you know, the democratic petty bourgeoisie wished to see the battle fought out in the clouds over its head between the departed spirits of parliament, right? You know, these are people who are thinking of, uh, of the law, of democratic institutions, of the constitution in these very abstract terms, right? Defend the constitution, not defend the rights of the people the constitution is supposed to protect. Points of comparison with the present day. 
Um, you know, I sometimes hear people say in arguments, but that's unconstitutional, right, to say that something should be defeated. Okay, the thing is unconstitutional, but it happened. The question, in some sense, isn't whether it's unconstitutional. The question is what we can do about it, right, because the thing happened. Um, another uh, point of comparison, there's a certain... I think fetishization of the idea of democratic institutions um, instead of actual democracy. So people think of democratic institutions as if we had a checklist, right? Okay, are we a democracy? Let's see, we have multiple parties, we have uh, laws that protect the independence of the judiciary, we have uh, a nominally free press. Okay, yes, we are a democracy. Without any concern for, you know, are those institutions actually serving the collective good? Are they actually engaging people, empowering the, the, this vast majority within the political sphere? So um, that's, I think, another thing that Marx is kind of pointing out as a problem that, that's still going on, this, this idea to take refuge in an abstract idea of democracy. Um, there are a couple more. I'm going to skip over those uh, because I want to at least pose the, the final questions here. Um, so the questions this, this piece on the Constitution raises for me. In the resistance to the Trump regime, are we fighting to preserve or protect democratic institutions or to expand democracy? Or if we're doing both, how do those two things relate to each other? Um, Second question, how should we as communists think and talk about the Constitution? Is it ready for the dustbin of history, or is it a guide to socialism USA? Document of democratic struggle, codification of bourgeois property relations. I'm being, you know, sort of facetious here, but we've entered a period, uh, I think a very key period, where the meaning of democracy and the notion of democratic institutions are subjects of public debate. And in this question of class consciousness and ideological work, I think that's something that we have to take on. So how do we do that? Um, finally, uh, what does real democracy look like? Um, and how, what criteria do we have to, to judge how democratic a society is? Uh, we have three minutes. Um, so I, we can probably take... You, you, know, can go, you can go over a little if, if the audience wants to. Um, well, let's say I'm going to ask that people keep their questions, comments to uh, maybe a, a minute if possible. Hopefully we'll have time for three. And with your kind permission, I might make a, a two-minute, you know, closing whatever, um, if that's okay. Okay. Use your raised if you want to speak. Hey, Norma, your mic is open. Norma, your mic is open. Okay, use your raised hand icon if you'd like to speak. Norma, your mic is open. We don't hear you. Okay, Alex. Alex, your mic. All right, thanks again. Um, I'm going to make a real quick um, comment, uh, my thoughts on the question about the Constitution. Um, all right, so I think, you know, um, to a certain extent, it is it is both. It is a document of democratic struggle, or and it is also a codification of bourgeois property relations. I don't necessarily think it's ready for the dustbin of history, but I wanted to quote, you know, at the end of the Fifth Amendment, it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Um, this, is, this is kind of problematic, I think, in, in, in like a revolutionary socialist, perspective in the sense that like uh, I would think that we would want to be able to um, 
uh, take control of major industries, major companies, and the, the assets of, of uh, billionaires, multinational corporation owners. Um, I, I would assume that we would want to be able to do that and, and only compensate people who are in genuine need. So I view there being maybe a need to modify the Constitution to a significant extent extent, but maybe it could work for Socialism USA. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting question, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Leonard, your mic is open. Leonard? Yeah, Scott, uh, first, uh, thanks so much for the uh, the thinking you put into this. It's, it's certainly sparking a lot of uh, um, thought in, in questions. I want to go back to uh, the point you made. I believe you were res you were responding to a question in the first uh, third of the presentation here, where you were talking about what would a decisive defeat of the far right look like. Uh, and, and I really like the approach you gave us about well, what would be on the table, what would be off the table, as a way of evaluating that. Uh, if, if I caught this right. Um, and uh, I agree with all that. The thing is, the examples you gave uh, that uh, questions about women's reproductive rights would be, at that point, uh, you know, off the table, that, you know, that those would be guaranteed, uh, that uh, there wouldn't be this ever-increasing push to fossil fuels and the pipelines and, and all that. And then you added a third one that... Uh, there would be a, a halt to the African Americans being killed on our in our streets. That wouldn't be. I, I'm. I don't think. I think that goes too far. Uh, um, if you're talking about the far right, and we're talking about the militias, we're talking about uh, Steve Bannon. I guess if we were to name some people in the White House, Trump himself, uh, defeating them. Um, we would be allied with a lot of uh, different forces out there, including many bourgeois forces that I'm not so sure would go along with those three points that you made. For example, just the fossil fuel area, uh, we're dealing with imperialists there. I, I don't think imperialism is, would have defeated the far right, would be willing to give up the whole uh, push uh, on fossil fuels, particularly oil and natural gas. I, I, maybe I think what would be begin to go off the table is we would outlaw the militias. I think would, there would be progress on the Second Amendment where we'd get an interpretation where we wouldn't have guns, uh, this plethora of guns uh, all over the country in the violence that unfortunately it's connected to. I could see that being taken off the table or be in the process of being taken off the table. But I think the other point you made would have defeated the far right. I, I think they actually would still, while progress would be made, I think there's those still would be on the table, unfortunately. I'm just wondering what you think about that. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're getting close to 9.05, so I'm going to take just a, a, a minute to respond to a few of those things. For anybody that uh, did not get a chance to ask their question. I do uh, apologize, and hopefully some of these will, will come up in other um, uh, webinars uh, that we do. Um, on the question of property rights uh, and compensation that, that Alex raised, um, certainly uh, the when the framers of the Constitution thought about uh, liberty, they were thinking I, I think primarily in the vein of the liberty to do what you want with your property with minimal government interference. So property rights are the basis of bourgeois constitutionality, um, for sure. And and that would be like rethinking the Constitution without property rights or with a different kind of property rights, collective property rights would be necessary and, and, and somewhat difficult. Um, uh, for... Um, Leonard, uh, I, 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 I think I agree with you on, uh, on some of your 
sort of hesitation about what I said. I, I was sort of, the examples I, I usually think of flew out of my head, and I, I was kind of picking, grabbing for things uh, that were present. Um, but it does depend on, you know, how you define the far right. Um, and it, it seems to be a, a moving target in a certain sense, because, you know, in the 2012 elections and the 2008 elections, the far right was folks like Scott Walker, Mitt Romney, um, who were not, who, who were anti-worker, anti-union, anti-environment, anti-woman, but were not these ardent, screaming, open, white supremacist, white nationalist um, militias. Uh, you know, th those were certainly there uh, somewhat, uh, you know, in the, in the Tea Party movement and on the fringes of that movement. But, you know, I think deciding what the far right is and what things we should fight to have taken off the table is, is part of that, that struggle. But I, I do agree, like, um, you know, the, the far right is not the only force that's pushing for increased fossil fuel exploitation or for the, um, the liberty of, of law enforcement officers to, uh, to kill people with impunity, um, certainly. Uh, um, and that, uh, yeah, I guess I just want to kind of go back to the overall thread running through these things that, you know, um, we're, we're entering a phase where uh, there is, there are real possibilities for ideological struggle, for the raising of class consciousness. And for me, the overall lesson that, that runs through Marx's writing on the class struggles in France is just class struggle. The fundamental motor of social change is class struggle. And, and that's kind of where we have to uh, keep our thinking grounded. Um, thank you very much for your, your, questions and your comments, which are, are certainly nourishing my thinking. And um, uh, thank you for joining us in this, in this session. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dee.